John grabbed me and pulled me down to the floor away from the window. Stay the hell down, he whispered. While we lay there, Frank and Philip rushed to cover up the windows with whatever debris and furniture they could get loose from the floor. Do they know we're here? Mia asked. Doesn't matter. We ain't taking any risks. We need to survive for four more days until we reach Guiana, John responded. They were quick to block the windows, and within a minute, we'd all settled down on the floor. We tried to discuss our next move as quietly as possible. On the other side of the door leading to the next car, we could hear the shuffling of surveyors trying to get in. They knew where we were, which meant the sentinels would be alerted very soon. They're behind the door. Can they hear us? I don't know. Stay quiet anyway. They might not know for sure that we're here, John said. What about your gun? I mean, if we kill the surveyors, they won't be able to alert the sentinels. Don't have any ammo. And besides, the idea's stupid. Even with the emergency lights dimly illuminating our car, it was hard to make out our surroundings. And with no idea how to turn them off, we could only pray that the surveyors didn't notice them either. A few hours passed with none of us daring to speak up, all fearing that the sentinels would come bursting in through the windows at any moment. The only one moving was Mia and she only did so to check on John's leg. Do we have any antibiotics in the bag? She asked. Philip opened and then rummaged through a large travel bag. In the dark, he couldn't see much, and after a minute, he decided to just empty the bag of all the random items that they'd gathered on the train, finally pulling out a box of pills. Amoxicillin? He half asked, half said. That's all we have? Me asked. Philip nodded and tossed me out of the box. She handed them over to John, giving them instructions on when and how many to take. The first 24 hours each marked by an innocuous beep from Mia's digital watch. I couldn't get my mind off the name. Jenea sounded familiar. It was definitely something I'd heard before, if only to be stuffed away in the back of my mind. Polluted by pointless information that I'd gathered throughout my life. 42 hours passed, as counted by the beeps. People were getting restless, unable to stand up or move without alerting the surveyors. We still hadn't made a decision whether to stay on the train as we reached Jenea or to, or to bail and try our luck out somewhere else. Are we really going to listen to some cryptic message? Philip asked. Like, I, I don't want to be all pessimistic, but why should we trust them? They're telling us to stay on the train. But do they mean as it stops or now while it's heading there? Mia yeah, asked. It doesn't matter. Shouldn't we just do the exact opposite of what they're telling us? No. Whatever happens, we're getting the hell off this train when it stops. As long as there's solid ground to walk on, we're not staying a minute longer than we have to, John interjected. Sixty hours passed, and the void lingered outside of our train. Ever-present and full of unseen horrors, despite the stress, I'd somehow managed to drift off to sleep. Though restless, it was a deep sleep, occupied by an incredibly vivid dream of Jenea. I saw it as an empty ruin of a city, trapped in the center of a steep valley. Mia and Frank stood by my side with defeated expressions on their faces. As we observed our surroundings, a bright light lit up the gray sky, almost blinding us with its presence. I tried to lift my arms to block out at least some of the light, but I couldn't lift them. Something within the light had paralyzed me, surging through my body with intense pain. As I winced in agony, my mind suddenly felt clearer than it had ever been. And then I remembered. It was just a piece of fragmented information long since forgotten that I learned during my childhood during some religious class. Jenea. It was hell, and, and, we, and we were heading straight for it. I awoke abruptly due to the high-pitched, glaring sound emitting from a speaker system hidden in the ceiling. It jolted all of us to our feet in a panic as we tried to decipher what it meant. What the hell is that sound? John yelled as he clutched his ears. It was rhythmic, Morse code, just like before, though in the mess of static and distortions, I could barely make out the individual beeps. After a couple of minutes, despite the mess of sounds, it became apparent that the sound was just a loop of beeps with a very simple message played on repeat. Leaving Vacus, stand by. Leaving Vacus, stand by. Leaving Vacus, stand by. Leaving Vacus, stand by. 
It was incredibly loud, vibrating enough to loosen the already fragile barricade in front of the door and windows. On the other side, the surveyors were trying to break through, and with a final push, the doors gave. Dozens of them flooded into the broken barricade, stumbling over each other in the process. All the while, they kept their eyes fixated on each of us, non-blinking, full of agony. Push them out, John yelled, as he rushed at them with a stick, shoving the one furthest behind back through the door, and then the next, but they kept coming back up. The rest of us rushed to aid John in his futile attempt, but before we could even reach him. A single window in the train shattered from the force of hundreds of sentinels, throwing their mangled bodies at the car. Covered in shards of broken glass, I fell to the ground alongside Frank, who tried to use me for balance. A piece of glass cut my left eye, temporarily blinding me from pain. As I got the piece of glass out, I saw sentinels digging their way through the broken windows, turning a viscous fog and pouring in through each crack in our barricade, reforming themselves on the other side, just like before. It was hopeless, and all we could do was to stand there in frozen panic, unable to think of any plausible escape. Escape. Mia and Philip had sought cover in one of the corners, where they sat embracing each other, while John charged at the sentinel, wielding nothing more than a kitchen knife. As the mix of sentinels and surveyors came at us, the alarm kept blaring, and I prepared for my quickly approaching demise. Leaving Vasquez, stand by. Suddenly, an impossibly bright light filled the entire void, instantly turning the sentinels to mere filaments of darkness lingering in the air. It persisted for minutes, completely blinding out any memory of the empty void that we'd left behind, and then... Then the speakers gave out a new message in the form of Morse code. Destination, Vienna. 18 hours. Do not get off the train. As quickly as it had come, the light faded. It took a while before our eyes adjusted, but once they did, we were greeted by a brand new world outside the windows. The once empty void had been replaced by endless fields of bright green grass only contrasted by tall blue mountains in the horizon, miles and miles away. The sentinels themselves had all but vanished while the surveyors had turned back into lifeless corpses and now doing nothing more than littering the hallways. Where are we? Mia asked. Yenna, did we make it? Frank asked. No. No, we still have 18 hours left, I corrected him. I took a hopeful look out the window and stared at the lush fields just out of reach. The ground looked so soft, and I contemplated for a moment whether it would be smarter to just jump off the train. The idea was quickly put to rest as I, I got a look around the train now filled with blissful daylight that immediately changed the mood. All right, let's head for the locomotive and try to shut this train down, John said. We quickly made our way through the train, littered with fresh corpses of people that died weeks ago. Their connections to the Sentinels had been broken, leaving them limp on the ground with no direction. Once we reached the locomotive, we were faced with a heavy iron wall blocking our entrance, a door with no handle nor keyhole to open it. Great, now what? Frank asked. Maybe we can climb out of one of the windows. Uh, get there from the outside, John suggested. Before we could even indulge the idea of climbing on the outside of the moving train, we were all shoved to the ground as the train rapidly lost speed. The tracks screeched as the wheels locked themselves in place, and we quickly came to a sudden stop. The hell just happened! We stopped. But, but there's no platform outside, Mia said as she peeked outside the window. It doesn't matter. Get your stuff, we're getting off this nightmare. <laughs> We returned to the dining car and picked up our bags, alongside any amount of food and supplies that we could possibly carry. We hadn't yet reached Guiana, but considering the implication that we were heading straight for hell, this would be a safer bet. For the first time in weeks, we stepped down on solid ground. And with a brilliant green field only a few feet away from us, Philip took charge, carrying what little medical supplies we had left while John followed. There was a decent brisk wind that felt great in the otherwise hot climate. But the grass didn't seem to sway even the slightest. As minute a detail as it seemed, it warranted a closer look. They were crystals. Green, razor-sharp crystals that form just a few feet away, resembling blades of grass. Wait! Uh, don't! I tried to yell, but it was too late, and Philip stepped down hard on the field. Ah! He yelled as the crystals cut into his shoes and into the soles of his foot. The rest of us froze in our steps as we saw Philip pull back in agony, clutching his leg. It's not grass. I trailed off. Oh, it hurts! Philip groaned. Mia instinctively ran to his aid and pulled off his shoe. Let me have a look, she said. There were green crystals embedded deep in his soul. 
covered in jagged edges, making it almost impossible to pull out without causing more damage. We've got to get you back on the... Mia froze, mid-sentence. The crystal was... spreading. With tiny shards breaking off and bedding themselves in Philip's skin, tearing through it as it grew. What? What's happening? Philip stuttered. Though the growth was slow at first, it quickly sped up, covering his entire foot within a minute, before proceeding up his leg. Get him off me! He yelled in pain as Mia reached out to try to rip them off, but John stopped before she could touch them. Wait! You'll get them on you too! John yelled. He pulled out his knife and got ready to peel the shards off Philip, but the crystal simply cut through the knife like butter, spreading onto that as well. In shock, John stumbled backward and dropped his knife. Mia once again tried to run over and help him, but we all held her back. All we could do was stare at Philip as the crystals dug their way into his body, his bones audibly cracking, his skin rupturing as they continued spreading. He just lay there screaming in agony until the crystals got to his lungs, and before long, his entire body had turned to rock. Before we could process or mourn our loss, the crystals started spreading along the ground, slowly making their way towards us. Back on the train! John screamed. As we got back on board, we did our best to seal the doors and windows, but even then we had no proof that it would stop the spread. The train had broken down, and with no way of getting it back up and running, all we could do was to wait as the green field of crystals spread onto the train and onto us. It's just a matter of time. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video. I want to talk to you about one quick thing uh, before we get into the real outro here, uh, and that's going to be the Australian fires that are currently taking place. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen on their social media or on the news or what have you about what's taking place in Australia right now. The fires are raging out of control. There's something like 1.5 million acres that are currently on fire. It's pushing animals towards extinction, forcing people out of their homes. Many of them YouTubers and other uh, creepypasta narrators um, that you probably listen to here. Um, but one thing that actually kind of gets to me is that there's there's a lot of awareness about what's taking place down there. There's a lot of photos and videos I'm pretty sure that you've all seen, but nobody's really talking about where you can go to to be able to donate, uh, to be able to help um, either firefighters or relief funds or anything like that. And that's what I want to try to bring to you guys, or at least have you guys try to share around, even if you're not able to donate. If you look in the description down below, there's four different links there uh, that I'm going to have on the videos for the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully we can, and we, I mean... <laughs> all of you uh, can be able to um, share this around and all of us together can be able to actually get some more eyes on where we can be able to go to help. I mean, yeah, we're a group of people that likes horror stories, horror movies, horror, what have you. But um, I think one thing we can do that's at least powerful for us is we have the ability to minimize the amount of horror in real life. Uh, so, thank you guys so much for watching or listening, if you're listening to this on the podcast, available on Spotify and on Apple and on SoundCloud and on Google or wherever you get your podcasts from. Or, if you're listening on the podcast, then thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing to Mr. Creepypasta. And a very big thank you to my patrons from patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, such as Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Chumpinski. Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephanie Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diane Krauss, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dugall, Daniel Polson, Dante Rao, The Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Sky Harbor, Finley, Steampunk Center, Rafael Rodriguez, and Optimistic Avocado. You guys are the MVPs and everybody down there in the description. A big thank you to you guys as well. Sweet dreams, everybody.